Well, let's have a question or two before we go have some more wine, <laughs> which Jesus would have approved of. Anybody have a question, thought for me? Yeah. Yes, please. Um, I was just wondering what you said about the intersection of the time and the sort of time. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most important things is that he says, in Paul Cortez, is in my own time, it's not the beginning. Mm -hmm. In my beginning, it's my end. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's, yeah, I think it's the circularity that interested him. I think also that basically he was a sort of, he was a critic of Paul Mest as well as a poet, uh, in the sense that after Paul Cortez, he said he would never write another poem because it would be too expensive for him to write poetry. Well, it probably exhausted him. Well, yeah. Yes. But I think, you know, if, if he, I think if I wrote the four quartets, I'd kind of retire. <laughs> I think I'd say, been there, done, no need. I think it is really his last word. I think it's his greatest work by far, yes. by far. Nothing compares. And Wasteland was sort of a breakdown, it was a society. Yeah. It was kind of a, yeah, it means amazing, you know, phrases and work in there, but it's kind of a breakdown. But then in the, certainly in the four quartets, he pulls it together. Exactly. All the bits, I think, are one Yeah, it's amazing how he integrated his entire philosophy. Fire and the Rose are one. Exactly. It's beautiful at the end of Little Gidding. It's wonderful, the end of life at the beginning of life. I, I had a student the other day, an, an, um, a Muslim in my class. I said this poem combines, uh, you know, obviously Christian thinking with a bit of Buddhism and Hinduism. And he raised his hand, he said, oh, there's a line here straight from the Quran. And I thought, whoa, <laughs> I missed that one. But you, Eliot's, you know, always there before you. That's another question. Yes, please. Do you think you could have um, found uh, spiritual satisfaction in, in any other traditions which perhaps he had considered following? Well, if you read his book um, on the idea of a Christian society, I think he so believed in <clears throat> being where you are. And if you're living in England, and if you're living within a Christian tradition, and you want to live within a community, that I think he, and I think he had a profound belief in Christianity as being the absolute way to go. So um, I have a hard time imagining that Eliot could have been happy, say, as a Buddhist. Maybe if he were living in Vietnam, that would have been the route he would have taken. So you wouldn't say that he was a believer in um, the tradition of the place that one found oneself living in. You, you, you think he's as well as an natural Christian, you thought that that was the uh, objectively more valid. I think he would have thought that, I mean, I don't know what he really thought, but I think he would have thought that being in the place somehow informed his religious possibilities and that he was going to have a much better chance of practicing discipline, the discipline of religion within the Christian tradition if you're in a Christian culture. I think he would have thought that, yeah. What do you think he would have thought of Well, he was, he w I think the, the re religiosity would have troubled him, that word. I think that he believed in established religion. He kind of did like the idea, as you know, of an established religion. He liked the fact that England had an established religion. But I think, you know, if you read Four Quartets, you know, here's, not, here's a man who is really open to all the possibilities of the spirit and is not going to be, could, could never stand religiosity. I mean, he was a genuine practitioner. And I think in the practice, he found his deepening faith. But I think he would not have been judgmental about anyone else finding a faith in some other vein. That's, that's my guess. Yes, sir. Yeah, it um, seems to me that uh, prayer is a very paradoxical um, kind of term in, in our culture. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and most people don't think about that but, but then on the other you know it is said that uh, he doesn't have a prayer which is to say that you know well you know, of course he's what, he would have a prayer that's what he would wish to do or you might say that um, there are no atheists in the trenches I think that's probably because people in the trenches mm -hmm. are as we're driven to pray uh, I would think by so some kind of, you know, by, it's, it's a very intuitive thing mm -hmm. So, so, so that maybe I'm just wondering if you could just talk about that 
paradoxical? Well, it's paradoxical. I think there are really at least two kinds of prayer. Obviously, there's private prayer. And, and even within that, I think there's prayer as petition uh, to make a bid, uh, right, bidden to, to, to God, the German word for it, and, um, right? Or as a bid for something. Uh, but I think it's kind of ridiculous to say, you know, give me a nice house. But I think that um, there's a prayer for help me to cope with the circumstances and to adjust my uh, feelings to the circumstances that I'm presented with. Help me to get through this. That seems a legitimate form of asking God for some help. But, um, then, there's, but then there's also prayer as listening, which I think is the most underrated form of prayer. And I think to be still and to listen for the voice of God is, is, is probably the most profound kind of personal prayer. Then we have public prayer where we are communally all saying, you know, we, you know, together becoming a body of people who are, I think there's something in that ritual and liturgy, which Eliot understood was extremely important. So prayer has many different aspects, yeah? Yeah. It's a passage that has to do with language, yeah. and struggle, and stress, and strain, and the impossibility of expressing through words, the reality that we're there. Yeah, I think that Eliot understood that language is difficult, and it's very hard to access divine reality through words. Possibly art is a better way of getting toward divine reality. Maybe dance is the purest form, perhaps music. Yes, so the music reach into the silence? It does. Words after you know silence reach into the heart of the matter, right? So yeah, We're, yes, please. Um, looking at your um, Eliot's five things, prayer, observance, thought, and action, is the reason why the Western world is such a mess is because our action hasn't got these four um, things before it? I would say a hundred percent. Of course, that's I would say a minority view, but I would think that. Um, we, have, we live in a very chaotic world, right? In America, we're confronted with this guy, Donald Trump, who, you know, he was, he was on a, some program being interviewed, interviewed, I was watching it a few weeks ago about his religious views. And he said, oh, he said, I love the, he said, my, my favorite book next to The Art of the Deal, which he wrote, is the Bible. <laughs> and, 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 and he, he said, um, um, you know, I'm, he said, I'm right up there with God. We, I'm really in that ballpark. You know, I know what it's all about. And the, the man said, well, Mr. Trump, have you ever, um, ever, ever been contrite before God and confessed your own sins? He said, I don't do that sort of thing. He said, I have no need for confession. He said that. You know, so it's the most astonishing thing. And I think he is the embodiment of what you get, this chaotic, materialistic world we live in, where you know there's no thought. Uh, certainly, there's no discipline. There's, there's no discipline. I mean, you're not getting prayer. You're not in, in most people. You're not getting prayer. You're not getting observance. You're not getting discipline. You're not getting thought. And so, action. I think you're perfectly right. Where do you go with action if you haven't had the four uh, other other things? You need it all to get right action. Otherwise, why would you be propelled toward right action? Really thinking first about your neighbor rather than yourself, to go beyond self-interest, right? Um, you know, it's too much uh, uh, economics has been based on. I mean, Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations says self-interest is uh, where it all starts. And I think, no, he had it wrong. I think, you know, if you've been properly practicing uh, a religious faith, you realize that, you know, it doesn't begin with self-interest. It begins with interest in the other. That's where it really begins. So it's the opposite of that. Yes? Something about the way you describe reading with your students, mm -hmm. and, um, the way you um, encounter with the poem is an individual matter, where mm -hmm. each have their own interpretation. Mm -hmm. But it also is a communal, or can be a, a, an active yes. sort of communion where people are arriving at an understanding. Well, that's where poetry functions like scripture. Right? I mean, why, what is, what is, how, does, how is scripture used? Right? What was Jesus' first act, when he, a public act? Was to go up and stand in, in, the, in, the, in the synagogue, the uh, ecclesia, in a gathering in uh, Nazareth, and read from the book of Isaiah. Right? 
and this is a communal act of reading. I mean, that's one of the first things Jesus does, is read poetry with other people. And, and you know, people probably knew the words very well. And so I think you know, that's one of the functions of poetry, is to read together. Yeah, reading together, seeing together. Yes? Um, it seems to be that one of the strongest features of the Anglo-Catholic tradition is um, sacramental practice and the, the importance of the sacramental life. Yes. Uh, could you say a little bit about how you see that fitting into these five? These five well, I think it's that I think you, when you talk about observance, I think that, that's part of having uh, and discipline to go together, observance and discipline. And I think the sacramental life, the Eucharistic moment is huge because it's, it's, it's the moment of access to the divine. So I think that, um, and also group practice and becoming the one body, right? I think it's incredibly symbolic, but it's real in every way. It's both symbol and, and reality. So I think you know, the, the sharing of the bread and the wine, becoming one body is crucial. Uh, uh, would you link that with? I'd link it with. The moment, the moment of the intersection of the timeless with time. Yeah, I think this is like this is one place where you're going to get the intersection of the timeless with time is in the Eucharistic meal. Absolutely, and I think if you know how else do you get that? Otherwise, it's just distractions. Moments of in the garden in the smoke fall, right? The moment in the arbor where the rain beat. The moment in the drafty church at smoke fall, right? So at least the, with the discipline of, of a regular um, liturgy, you are getting the Eucharistic meal and you're having a point of the intersection of the timeless with time. Well, yes? Um, it, it may be too late in a whole lot of paper, but um, I ask you about all the moments of death in the four quartets. And what do you think he's trying to say about, about death? Well, I think he's thinking, especially in each part four of the, each quartet, is a kind of meditation on death. And I also think he's thinking about, uh, I mean, it gives us the other epigraph to the four quartets, which is that the way up and the way down are the same. And so one of the ways to eternity is through the, uh, the negative way, the via negativa, and through the way of dislocation, the way of disaffection. And I think Eliot would see death as the door to life. I mean, I think he's understanding that paradox. It's only through I mean, death is a great accession of life. In my end, as you were saying, is my beginning. So Eliot is aware of, is working with, and, and with suffering. Eliot is suggesting in each of the fourth sections of the quartets that suffering is useful, has its purpose. I, I mean, I think anyone, anyone knows that, in fact, Faith always intensifies, religious practice intensifies in moments of extreme anxiety, difficulty, awareness of mortality, and uh, painful things. I mean, and I think it, we, I, I for, personally believe in my own life I've only made spiritual progress in times of extreme stress. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we all are given these things every day of our lives, practically. Some of us, are, we're all given moments of extreme stress. Extreme stress. I mean, I don't, I don't think anybody gets out. I mean, if you've read the fine print in the contract, there's going to be an awful lot of that. So I, I, I consider all these moments of extreme stress, while horrible, are moments when we really can make spiritual progress. So I think Elliot is suggesting as much. Well, I should, one more question. Well, he was. I was thinking about you debating Christopher Hitchens, whether there was any point at which you either did feel that Eliot could be useful in making your argument, or whether afterwards, or even now, because there's quite a lot that you've been talking about that others have been talking about too, where I felt that there was, both at an intellectual and at a human level, an interface um, with. It's funny, I sat with Hitchens in the, in, in the sort of back of the theater afterward. He seemed very human, very vulnerable, and he said, you know, I will be dead in about a year. And uh, he was very, and I thought in that vulnerability, he probably came closest to faith in something, you know? Interestingly enough, I think, I could see his, he, he didn't, his heart did not seem in arguing against God. 
And I felt almost like, you know, uh, uh, this is ridiculous. I, it's, I'm not, this is not a fair fight. You know? What's that? Well, he was, you know, he, he had cancer and he was going to be. So, so he had time to think. That's true. So maybe he had some deep thoughts toward the end. Well, listen, thank you for your attention. <laughs>